Could we get to space with a railgun? Could your job be replaced by AI? What's up with Neuralink? Can we build an elevator on the moon? Why aren't plug-in hybrid cars more popular? You ever visited a truck stop? Would you display this as a trophy? Can you remember the tallest man you've ever seen? All this and more in today's lightning round video. Lightning round video, by the way, not to be confused with round lightning video. For that, you need to see my ball lightning video. Because, you know, it's round. But let's get to today's questions. Mark Hoffman asked, the idea of an EM-driven mass accelerators as an orbital launch platform has been around for some time, yet seems to rarely get past the drawing board. Has there been much progress in designing such a platform? And what major issues might still need to be overcome? Weirdly, this came up in the OLF reunion live stream that I did. Uh, you can check it out if you want to hear me talk about this with Tim Dodd and Ben Zolens. But yeah, probably the biggest issue is just the size of the launcher because it kind of has to get out of our atmosphere. Rockets only go straight up for the first 30 seconds or so, just high enough to get past the thickest part of the atmosphere, and then they have to reach orbital velocity, which is 15,000 miles an hour. Yeah, you know how things burn up in the atmosphere at orbital velocity when it comes back through into the atmosphere? That's what would happen on the launch pad if you took off at that speed. So yeah, an orbital railgun would probably have to be like 150 miles long and at least several miles up into the air. I mean, this, this is mega project territory. Now, some have suggested you could put the ramp on the side of a tall mountain uh, to take advantage of that. But I mean, it, first of all, it'd have to be a really tall mountain, like some of the tallest mountains in the world. And then also it's not the easiest place to get to with the payload. Not to mention the entire length of the railgun would need to be in a vacuum tube, which costs a lot of energy. Yeah, it's, you're basically building a vertical hyperloop. Now the other option is rocket assisted railgun, which means it would basically, you know, yeet it up past the thickest part of the atmosphere and then the second stage of the rocket would kick in and take it the rest of the way. Which is an interesting idea. It's kind of like the railgun takes the place of the first stage. Now I couldn't find any companies that are actively working on this right now. Feel free to point some out in the comments if I missed it. Uh, but there is another company working on a similar technology. You probably know where I'm going with this. Spin Launch Systems recently tested their prototype Mega Yeet machine that spins a payload at high speed before launching it out of a tube, letting it get to extremely fast speeds without the need for a long railgun track. They call it an orbital accelerator or a kinetic space launch system. Totally electric and reaches hypersonic speeds, but would still need a rocket assist because again, orbital speed would melt everything. In fact, as Scott Manley pointed out in his video on this, thermal imaging on the projectile shows how hot it gets just immediately after launch from air friction. There's still a big question mark as to whether or not they'll actually be able to get into orbit with this, but I guess we'll see where things go. But back to railguns, they actually had a minor setback recently because the US Navy had been developing a hypervelocity railgun. Uh, they spent $500 million on it and they recently canceled the program. They had a prototype on board the USS Trenton, but they've dropped the program in favor of a hypervelocity projectile or HVP, which can be fitted to traditional gunships. So yeah, I'm skeptical that we're ever going to see an orbital railgun uh, device. Although I have made the argument before that something like that could be useful on the moon because you don't have that pesky atmosphere to deal with. On that note, Cole Parker asked, would it be much easier to build a space elevator on Mars or the moon due to the much lower gravity? So yeah, I covered space elevators once before on this channel, um, link down below, but that was one of the assertions that I made was that a space elevator would make a lot more sense on the moon than here on Earth. Again, because of the lower gravity. I feel like I just said something like that in the last video. That was, that was weird. But yeah, in a nutshell, for anybody who doesn't know, the space elevator is a way to lower launch costs because instead of launching something, you would literally just run the payload up a tether that starts on the ground and goes all the way up to a base in geostationary orbit. This is obviously a ridiculously long tether that would need to uh, handle all kinds of crazy forces uh, requiring a material science that we don't have yet. Not to mention it would need to survive getting constantly pelted by micrometeorites and orbital debris and satellites. It's a tough sell. But the advantage is if we could do it would be huge because getting a payload into orbit would just require running something up a tether. It would cost next to nothing. Many of the major challenges involved with the space elevator would not exist on the moon. And it turns out that there's been a lot of thought put into this. In a 2019 paper, two astrophysicists from uh, Columbia and Cambridge universities took a good look at this idea and they did the math and the math checks out. So it wouldn't be like a space elevator on Earth where it's being kept in place by centripetal force because the moon doesn't spin the way the Earth does being tidally locked and all. Instead, the idea here is that you would have a line going all the way from the moon down to basically geostationary orbit above the Earth. 
where there would be another base and the, the gravity of the Earth would be pulling on that base to keep the line taut. But yeah, in this case, to get to the moon, all you've got to do is fly up to that base and dock with it and then just slide along that tether, just being run by electricity on solar power. It would lower the cost to get to the moon by a factor of thousands. And, uh, according to the authors anyway, would only cost a few billion dollars to build. Of course, it's all easier said than done. We're talking about a 225,000 mile tether. So yeah, you would need to build a tether long enough to wrap around the Earth 28 times and then launch that to the moon and then launch it back to Earth. Actually, you would probably set up a base at the Earth-Moon Lagrange point and then extend the line in both directions from there, but still. You would also have to contend with the fact that the moon's orbit is not perfectly uh, circular, it's a little elliptical. That means that the, uh, the base down in geostationary orbit would rise and fall. So yeah, the lack of gravity helps with the idea of a, a lunar uh, space elevator, but it's kind of made up for by the massive distance that that tether has to be. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people that are working on it. There is a company called Liftport working on this very idea. But you also mentioned Mars, and that's actually where things get interesting because Mars not only has 1% of the atmosphere, so there's less of that to deal with, and one third of the gravity, so there's less of that to deal with, but it also has another ace up its sleeve. It's moon Deimos. Deimos has a rotational period shockingly close to that of Mars' sidereal day, which is shockingly close to our day, and it's about the same distance as our geostationary orbit on Earth. And if that wasn't enough, Deimos is mostly made out of carbon. So if you had some kind of autonomous factory that could mine and then produce carbon nanotubes right there on Deimos, you could just extend that line down to Mars. We would need to adjust the orbit a little bit though. Anyway, that presents some interesting possibilities, but it would require some technologies that we don't completely have just yet, but still interesting to think about. Mike Reed asked, which jobs are most likely to be replaced as AI grows? How will low wage manual labor workers get a job once AI does all this work? All right, this is a very good question, and I wanted to give it a pretty good answer. So I found an article on Medium by Kai-Fu Lee. Uh, he's the president of Google China, he's an AI expert, and he wrote a book called AI Superpowers. In this article, he lists the 10 jobs first on the chopping block due to AI. Now, I think that eventually all jobs are gonna be threatened by AI, but these are the most immediate ones to be concerned about. Number one is telemarketers and telesales. I mean, we're already seeing robocalls taking over this space, but he talks about how AI can be trained to understand people's tone and adjust its own tone accordingly, and even know if you react better to a male or female voices and choose the best one for every call. Similar to that is customer support. Now, again, we're talking about seeing chatbots and AI assistants taking over a lot of this already online, but it's closing in on phone support as well because a lot of the people doing these jobs are just reading scripts anyway. Next up is warehouse workers. Not a surprise to anyone, I'm sure. We're already seeing robots doing a lot of the heavy lifting in Amazon's warehouses and whatnot, but as they become more dexterous, they'll continue taking over spots that are now held by people. Then you've got clerks and operational staff. So there's a lot of large companies that deal with huge amounts of data, and they employ thousands of people to manage and process this data. Everything from filing, procurement, inventory management, error correction, estimating sales and reporting, and much of that can already be automated. Telephone operators are also on the chopping block. With the progress of speech recognition and dialogue-oriented speech synthesis, the days of an actual person to answer and direct calls are pretty much numbered for a lot of businesses. Tellers and cashiers are going to be a thing of the past. Think about how many self-service checkout lines there are now. That trend is not going to slow down. And according to Kai-Fu Lee, fast food worker jobs are in trouble. Basically, any repetitive and stationary job is likely to be done by a robot soon, and burger flipping is pretty much the definition of that. There are already robotic burger flippers in some restaurants, and also order taking is something that can be automated as well. Sticking with restaurants, dishwashers will be going away soon. There's already a startup in California called Dishcrab, developing systems that can wash thousands of dishes a day using far less water and energy. Something else likely to be phased out are assembly line inspectors. Again, it's something fixed and repetitive, and computer vision can easily find cracks and blemishes in units on an assembly line, probably better than a human. And last but not least are couriers. Delivery robots and drones are likely to take over this space, especially in structured environments like large office complexes and hotels. Basically, if your job is repetitive and requires very little human interaction, you might want to start looking for a job that requires more dexterity and is more human-focused. If you're in one of those jobs and are currently wetting your pants as I say this, um, I'll put the link down below. He does go into some details on, on ways that you can pivot out of what you're doing into something that might be a little bit more safe down the road. Brian Beswick asked simply, what's up with Neuralink? Yeah, I've been meaning to follow up on this topic for a while now, but there just hasn't really been much to report on. Um, but here's what I could stir up anyway. 
Last time we got a presentation, Elon showed how the implant was working in a pig's brain to pick up signals from its snout. The pig wasn't controlling anything, it was just basically showing how they were receiving signals from the snout whenever it touched something. And there was an updated version of the implant that looked a little rougher and clunkier than the first presentation, but at least it was a real thing and not just a rendering. Then in April this year, they revealed footage of a monkey playing Pong using only a chip in its brain. They showed how they trained the monkey, whose name is Pager, to play this little computer game where he boops the squares using the joystick. And then the Neuralink chip is registering the signals being created to do this. It even streams to a smartphone. By the way, that metal tube in his mouth is a little reward mechanism that gives him some food every time he gets it right. But they eventually collect enough data that they can control the game with the implant. As you can see, the joystick is unplugged here, so he's moving that cursor with his mind. And then they showed him playing Pong, and there's no joystick at all now. This is totally the monkey in a Neuralink chip. So this is actually a pretty big deal because one of their stated goals, their early stated goals anyway, is to give paraplegics and quadriplegics uh, access to being able to use computers and phones like everybody else. And this is looking pretty close to that. So, I mean, yeah, their next presentation, which they may have one coming up soon. They haven't done one in over a year. Um, who knows, they may actually have a person controlling a computer with a Neuralink chip. <laughs> Place your bets in the comments. Real talk though, people being able to control basic computer stuff with their brains actually isn't anything new. They've been doing this for a while with something called the Utah Array, but it's big and clunky and doesn't allow for much getting around and movement and stuff. Uh, and the Neuralink chip might also be more sensitive. So we'll, we'll see if it's an improvement on what already exists. But yeah, right after the monkey video, they might have hit a little bit of a snag because the co-founder of Neuralink and the president, a guy named Max Hodak, left the company. And nobody really knew what to make of that. But still, they did secure a third round of funding in July for $205 million from uh, Google Ventures and I believe Peter Thiel. And this makes the total investment into Neuralink so far $323 million, uh, which when you consider Elon has $300 billion to his name, seems kind of low. So that's the last news I could find about Neuralink, but there are a couple of other companies in this space that are doing something similar, including a company called Science Corp, which is the most ambiguous name I've ever heard in my life, but they raised $47 million in August. Interesting thing about Science Corp, their CEO is Max Hodak, the guy who just left Neuralink. Yeah, this company wants to make brain machine interfaces, but they are hiring specifically CRISPR experts. So it's thought that they may have some bioengineering involved with it as well. I guess we'll see. Yeah, right now they're very much in stealth mode. We really don't know exactly what they're working on. And another company called BrainGate made some news in April of this year by uh, wirelessly connecting a couple of participants' brains to a computer. Uh, yeah, kind of basically what Neuralink did with a monkey, these guys did with two people. So that's noteworthy. So yeah, I mean, progress is being made in multiple different directions. And Cole Parker asked, why aren't plug-in hybrid electric vehicles more popular in America and Europe? I don't know if I have a good answer for this. If any of you have a better answer, please do chime in in the comments. My guess is that EVs are maybe more popular because now we associate them with their instant torque and being fast off the line and with the cool tech and everything that they have, whereas plug-in hybrids are more just kind of gas sippers. And if you want a car that burns less gas, I mean, you can't get any less than no gas at all. So EVs appeal to the torque heads and the tree huggers, and plug-in hybrids appeal to... Not to say the plug-in hybrids don't have their place. I mean, they do kind of have the best of both worlds. You can do your daily driving, mostly on electric, and then you've got that gas backup if you want to take long trips. But I guess EVs are more popular now because they're just, they're just the new hotness, which is not something I could have imagined saying even five years ago. And I think maybe a lot of the PHEV models were kind of compliance cars to keep their fleet mileage down for regulatory reasons. So a lot of these car companies weren't really marketing them very well, and that's why you haven't really heard as much about them. I may be making an assumption there. I could be wrong about that. You guys tell me. But yeah, like I said, the fact that this is even a question being asked is just mind blowing to me. You know, as, as somebody who's loved EVs for a long time and have been advocating for them, it's just always felt like I'm just banging my head against the wall and nobody's hearing the message. And now suddenly, Everybody's crazy about them. Car companies are falling over themselves to make more of them to the point that we're actually asking the question, what happened to hybrids? <laughs> you know, it's just, that's amazing to me. So that's all the questions we have today. Feel free to chime in with your thoughts down in the comments. And if you want to see a deep dive full video on any of these topics, please let me know. It could be a thing. What could also be a thing is you could get some amazing new clothes from today's sponsor, Mack Weldon. Mack Weldon is more than just great underwear, though they are pretty much my favorite pair in the drawer, but they also have a full line of clothes as well. 
T-shirts, pants, shorts, polos, button-ups. One of my favorite shirts is my Mack Weldon polo shirt. And they have jackets and vests now that the weather's cooling off. And these are available in a variety of fabrics that they designed in-house. They've got air knit to keep you cool, warm knit to keep you warm, and the silver series that's antimicrobial and prevents odor. And they put all this together in a whole clothing system that they call the daily wear system. It's comfortable, it's fashionable, but most of all, it's, it's just simple. And the holidays are coming up. It's a great place to get some holiday shopping done. Just saying. Especially because you can get 20% off your first order when you go to macweldon.com slash Joe Scott and then enter Joe Scott as the promo code at purchase. You got the holidays coming up. You might be starting to think about gifts for people and whatnot. Well, this is a good place to do it. And you can get, you can get some, some money off on it. Save a little money, get some good presents. It's all good. Anyway, you might be surprised what all they have on their website. There's, there's plenty of stuff there. So if you want to go check it out, it's macweldon.com slash Joe Scott and our promo code Joe Scott when you check out. And I'll put the link down below. Thanks to Mac Weldon for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and my YouTube members who are just being awesome, having an awesome community, being amazing parts of this thing that I have going on. How about I read some names? Uh, we got some new members. They are Joshua Clark, A.N. Zion, <laughs> Angie White, Billy Boren, Chris Kibbe, uh, Ventenors, Rory Grimshaw, Felipe Longo, D. Dahl, uh, Syntax, Joel Muraka, Fish Sandwich, Han didn't shoot first, science did. <laughs> Love that. Michael Onstad, Vlad Grievedetsky, and Franzilla. I murdered some of those. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and all other kinds of cool stuff, just uh, hit the little join button down below this video. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video. Google thinks you might like that one too. Any of the others down here, they got my face on them on the side. Go take a look. And uh, yeah, if you enjoy it, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.